Welcome students to exercise 29, which is going to focus on blood, um, which is something that you will um, probably become quite familiar with um, if you go into the, the healthcare field. Um, I'm going to start with just some kind of generic properties, um, starting with what actually type of tissue is blood. Blood is not an organ, it actually happens to be a tissue. Um, and the type of tissue that it is, is a connective tissue. Uh, so connective tissues are like support tissues, right? But they all have this common feature of they have some various kind of cells kind of suspended in this kind of largely non-living extracellular matrix. Well, the extracellular matrix in blood is what we call plasma. It's the, the fluid part of our blood. And then within the um, plasma kind of suspended in it are then all of these different formed elements, um, things like the erythrocytes or the red blood cells, the leukocytes or the white blood cells, and then what are known as thrombocytes, um, which are kind of more commonly called platelets. So if we look at kind of what is in blood all together, um, if we look at the plasma portion of the blood, it's mostly water, um, but we'll also find uh, what we call plasma proteins, things like albumin, which is an osmotic component of blood, um, fibrinogen, which helps the coagulation process, uh, globular proteins for like transporting lipids and uh, lipid soluble hormones and anything like that. Um, and then you're going to find your respiratory gases, nutrients, electrolytes, vitamins, waste products, just all kinds of other kind of miscellaneous stuff. Um, but of course, the biggest portion of the plasma is, is mostly water. Um, and then if we looked in the formed elements, we have the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, that's what we have most of um, in terms of the formed elements. And then we have platelets, which are for coagulation, and then all of the various types of white blood cells or leukocytes. Uh, the red blood cells themselves, the erythrocytes, and they are the most abundant of our formed elements, and they're really, really important because that's how oxygen gets to all of our tissues and all of our organs. Um, it's carried around on red blood cells. Um, and red blood cells have this very, very specific shape. It's called a biconcave disc. It looks like a hockey puck. Um, and what this does is creates a lot of surface area relative to a pretty small volume. Um, that means the red blood cells can carry a lot of hemoglobin because it's hemoglobin, this protein um, that's embedded in our red blood cells, um, that is um, what is actually carrying the oxygen. The erythrocytes themselves are a nucleate. They're without organelles by and large. They're really just essentially sacks of hemoglobin. And so that hemoglobin is really um, quite vital to the overall function of our red blood cells. If we look at our leukocytes or our white blood cells, and when we look at the leukocytes histologically, the stain that is most commonly used is known as the right stain. And the right stain gives all of the different leukocytes very distinctive um, kind of coloration patterns um, so that it's quite, I won't say easy to differentiate between them, but there are fairly clear differences, starting with whether or not there are granules visible or, or not present at all. Uh, the granulocytic white blood cells will have the granules. Those are our neutrophils, our basophils, and our eosinophils. The agranulocytic leukocytes don't have any um, granules in them. Those are the monocytes and the lymphocytes. So we're going to go through um, each of the five white blood cells here um, so you can kind of see what they look like and what they do. If we look and start with our neutrophils, uh, maybe, hopefully, if it will let me go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so here we have our neutrophils. Um, in terms of what they look like, really small purple granules. In fact, you may not even see the granules that well. Um, cytoplasm is kind of pink, maybe light lavender-ish, um, but the really key thing is these multi-lobed nuclei. Um, so whenever you see kind of lots and lots of lobes on a nucleus, 
Um, you're almost always looking at a neutrophil. Um, what neutrophils do is they phagocytize bacteria. So if you get a bacterial infection, neutrophils basically act like Pac-Man um, and, and eat the bacteria. If we look at the basophils, um, they have very large granules. In fact, the granules are so abundant that they actually obscure the nucleus. The cytoplasm tends to be purple. Uh, the nucleus is a bilobed nucleus, um, but it's very often very difficult to see um, because it's basically kind of hidden by the purple granules. Um, basophils play a role in our inflammatory responses. They release a substance called histamine. Um, so if you've ever been really congested um, and you get Benadryl or something like that, you're taking an anti histamine, uh, that antihistamine is trying to tamp down on the activity of these basophils. The eosinophils, um, they tend to have really large purple granules, not only in the cytoplasm, but also in their nucleus as well. Um, and the right stain tends to give their cytoplasm a very distinct kind of red-orange color that all of the other white blood cells will lack. Um, they have a, a bilobed nucleus as well, kind of purplish, again, lots of granules in it. Uh, the key thing with them is that kind of reddish-orange cytoplasm. Um, now, eosinophils, what they kind of fight off or help us fight off are parasitic infections. So if you've got a worm or something like that, um, you're going to get a, a lot of eosinophils being formed um, as a reaction to that. Um, and they also play a role in our allergic responses. And if you know anyone who has asthma, um, they often also play a role in those kinds of responses as well. The monocytes, um, these are one of our agranulocytic white blood cells, so they have no granules, and these are the largest of the white blood cells. They're all of the most of the, all of the uh, granulocytic white blood cells are bigger than a red blood cell, but the monocytes are like twice the size of a red blood cell, so they are by far um, kind of the biggest thing here visible in terms of our formed elements. Um, they tend to have a kind of light cytoplasm, blue-gray, purple-gray, um, and these big kind of dark, large, kind of horseshoe or kidney-shaped nuclei like you see here. Uh, but again, big, big cells. Um, and what they function as are macrophages. So uh, again, if you get a viral infection or a bacterial infection or a parasitic infection or a cancerous cell or um, anything like that, um, macrophages basically kind of glom onto that thing, suck it in, and, and eat it, essentially. Lastly, we have our lymphocytes. Uh, again, they are agranulocytic, so no granules present. Um, these are actually the smallest of the white blood cells. Um, they're about the size of a red blood cell, maybe a little bit bigger, not, not too terribly much bigger though. Um, you're only going to see a small sliver of cytoplasm, usually that's um, kind of light blue, uh, and then they tend to have these really large purple nuclei that basically take up most of the cell, which is why you only end up usually with like a little sliver of the, the cytoplasm showing, um, as you can kind of see here. And now what the lymphocytes do is they function as our adaptive immune system. So if you get a really bad infection, um, these T cells and B cells um, will trigger and they will respond to that very specific infection that you got, um, which makes them really quite powerful. In terms of abundance, neutrophils are the most abundant, followed by the lymphocytes, the monocytes, the eosinophils, and then lastly, the basophils. And so when you start looking through the slides in the lab, um, you may have difficulty finding a basophil. Um, so certainly if you do see a basophil as you're identifying white blood cells here, um, certainly definitely call me over and we'll give everybody a chance to look at the basophil. Um, I am terrible at mnemonics. Um, I, I suck at them. I'm not good at come up with, uh, coming up with them. I always would just prefer to just remember what the thing is. Um, the exception to that happens to be this one only because I love the kind of irony of it. Um, and so a good way to remember the um, abundance of our leukocytes is never let monkeys eat bananas. So neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils. And I think that's funny and ironic because of course monkeys love bananas. Um, the other thing that um, you're going to get a chance to do uh, in lab um, 
is something that is incredibly, 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 incredibly vital. And uh, this is, if you're gonna work with a healthcare for your old, this is something that you need to know and you need to know well, not just because I'm gonna test you on it, because if you give somebody the wrong blood type, you can kill them. Um, so you have to understand blood typing. It's incredibly, incredibly vital. When we look at blood typing and blood types, we have to start with some basic vocabulary. Uh, and that's defining what an antigen is versus what an antibody is. So an antigen is um, a little protein that's actually attached, uh, embedded in the red blood cells. Um, and one of the things that antigens do is they help your body identify what cells belong to you versus what cells don't belong to you. So all, your, all of your red blood cells have a little antigen on them that says, hey, I belong to this body. And if you were to get an, a, a different blood type that didn't have the same antigen, then your body would say, oh, hey, that's not me, and, and, and respond to that. The antibody is the protein that is kind of floating in the blood plasma. It's not attached. But if the antibody sees the antigen that it recognizes, um, it will bind to that antigen almost kind of like a lock and key. Um, and so this is part of the problem when it comes to blood transfusions. If you give somebody the wrong blood type, um, the recipient's antibodies will attack the donor's antigens um, and, and will have a problem. The other thing when it comes to blood types that we have to discuss is a little bit of, um, shall we say, genetics 101. If you've ever had a genetics class, this should seem really familiar with, to you. But when we talk about a genotype, what we are talking about is like the genetic code. What two alleles do you have for um, expressing this particular gene for this particular trait? The phenotype is then the physical expression of that gene. What is your gender? What is your hair color? What is your eye color? What blood type do you have? We have um, two sets of chromosomes. We get one set of chromosomes from our mother, one set of chromosomes from our father, and that results in what kind of two alleles we get for each gene. And genes have kind of three ways that they can be expressed. They could be the dominant gene, in which case that gene is always expressed. Um, doesn't even matter what the other allele is, what the other gene is, the dominant gene, the dominant allele will still be expressed. You can also have a recessive allele. Now, a recessive allele um, will only be expressed if both sets from both parents is a recessive trait. And if you do not have that kind of two recessive genes, then the dominant gene will kind of overpower the recessive gene and you'll see the dominant trait, not the recessive trait. Um, and then there's also what we call codominance, wherein both genes are equally expressed and kind of neither is kind of overpowering the other. A really good example occurs with um, these little flowers here. So purple is the dominant cover, color white is the recessive color. So if you have purple two big P, white, little P. If you have two big P's, uh, 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 two dominant genes, then you're gonna get a purple flower. If you have a dominant gene and a recessive gene, you're still going to get the purple flower because the purple is dominant over the recessive. Um, if you, it's only a white flower when it is homozygous recessive, meaning you get a recessive allele from your mom, recessive allele from your dad. Since you have two recessive genes, the two recessive alleles, then that's how you end up with the white flower. Um, so we have dominance and recessiveness in blood typing as well, which is why we have to go over that little bit of genetics there. We have four main blood types in the ABO system. That's type A, type B, type AB, and type O. Your blood type is determined by what antigen you have on your red blood cells. So for instance, I happen to have type A blood. That means I have A antigens on my red blood cells. The recessive blood type is O. The dominant genes are A and B, which means that people who have type AB blood actually have these co- dominant genes, meaning both the A gene is expressed and the B gene is expressed. So let's take a look. These are our different blood types, type A, type B, type AB, and type O. Type A antigen, type A blood, 
has type A antigens, which means they're going to have anti-B antibodies. And their genotypes, possibly, are going to be AA or AO, two dominant A's or a dominant and recessive, in which case the recessive is hidden by the dominant. Type B blood has B antigens and anti-A antibodies. Um, their genotypes, possible genotypes, two big Bs or BO. If we have type AB blood, then we have an A antigen and a B antigen, which means no antibodies, because otherwise your own antibodies would react to your own antigens. The genotype for AB is a and B. You have to get an A gene and a B gene in order to have type AB blood. For type O blood, you have no antigens. There isn't an O antigen. O blood just lacks A and B antigens. They will have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies so that if they were to receive um, either of the other blood types, um, they have the ability to recognize that it's foreign blood. Um, and the only way we end up with type O blood is if you get a recessive allele from each parent. Um, so in terms of blood transfusions, who can give to who, who can receive from who, type A blood can receive blood from type A people and type O people. Type B blood can receive from type B people and type O people. Type AB blood can receive from type A people type B people, type AB people, and type O people. People who have type O blood can only receive from other people who have type O blood. In terms of um, who type A can give to, they can give to A and AB. B can give to B and AB. AB can only give to AB, and O can give to A, B, AB, and O. So if we look at our um, kind of donors here, our universal donor ends up being type O. If we look at our recipients, our universal recipient is type AB. So type O can donate to all of the other blood types, while type AB can receive from all of the other blood types. Um, if you give someone the wrong blood, then a transfusion reaction occurs. Essentially what happens is here you can see the anti-B antibodies and here you can, so this person has type A blood, so they have A antigens on their, anti, on their red blood cells with anti-B antibodies. If you give this type A person type B blood, then the anti-B antibodies will attach to the B antigens on the donor blood and we'll get kind of what we call agglutination, which means clumping, like the red blood cells will kind of stick together and they can cause clots, they can cause the blood cell to burst, in which case you're like bleeding internally, your oxygen carrying capacity is down, your blood flow is restricted, um, and you literally, you can, you can kill somebody. Um, so making sure you understand blood typing and blood transfusions is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly vital for anyone in the healthcare field. The other thing that we have to talk about in terms of blood types is what is known as the RH factor. Um, the RH factor is an additional antigen that is sometimes present. Most of us have it, but some of us don't. Um, this determines whether you have positive or negative blood. I'm type A positive, meaning I have an A antigen and the RH antigen. Um, so if the RH antigen is present, is present, then you have positive blood, RH positive blood. If you do not have an RH antigen, then you have RH negative blood. And the RH negative is much less common um, because RH positive blood is dominant. In terms of giving transfusions, um, when we take into account the RH factor, um, the first thing, of course, that we have to do is match the ABO type first. Um, no matter what the RH factor is, you still have to match the ABO system first. Um, you couldn't give like AB blood to an A person, no matter what their RH factors were. RH positive people can receive blood from RH positive people or RH negative people. RH negative people can only receive other RH negative blood. So if we look at our kind of blood transfusions and factor in the RH factor, 
type A blood or A positive blood can receive from A positive, A negative, O positive, O negative. Type A negative can only receive from A negative and O negative, no positive blood. Type B positive can receive B positive, B negative, O positive, O negative. Type B negative can receive B negative or O negative, again, no positive blood. Our AB positive person, A positive, A negative, B positive, B negative, AB positive, AB negative, O positive, and O negative. AB positive blood is the universal, universal recipient. Um, AB negative, all of the A, all of the, the negatives, A negative, B negative, AB negative, and O negative. O positive can receive O positive and O negative. O negative can receive O negative. So O negative is our kind of universal, universal donor.